this is special um, a special uh, courses for the graduate students in Tongji, and um, the general topic is the digital um, technology in architecture. So we organize the um, uh, the lecture series in different sequence, including um, uh, local professors, and also um, we invite Philip from uh, ETH and uh, Philip and you, and gave three lectures together. So it's a great honor to have you here. I'd like to uh, firstly. Uh, introduce um, um, Tom, uh, Tom uh, who is actually from um, um, uh, ETH NCCR. Um, um, uh, NCCR is, uh, as we all know, is the uh, worldwide known um, uh, digital fabrication uh, platform uh, uh, sponsor set up by uh, uh, Swiss government and uh, <coughs> play a very important leading role in the world, especially focus on digital fabrication and uh, robo robotic um, uh, development. Uh, I know Tom, uh, I think around uh, four or five years, uh, it's a great honor to uh, know him because of um, Compass. So today I think uh, 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 Philip uh, uh, invite uh, Tom to give us a very special lecture, uh, uh, introduce um, the Compass platform, which uh, developed in CCR over the past uh, five years. So we already actually invite um, Tom and coming to Shanghai in the future um, uh, 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 workshop and teaching, I think at least twice, uh, I think, and also, uh, my group um, uh, influenced a lot by this uh, open source culture, actually, which is uh, totally the framework written in Python, uh, which aim to streamline uh, multidiscipline workflow and uh, the integration of state of art and tooling to simplify uh, the development adoption by architects and designers, researchers, and also uh, the uh, robotic developers. Um, so it's a great honor. And today we have um, Tom here. And uh, I think before Tom's uh, lecture, uh, 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 perhaps, uh, Philip, would you like to add in uh, some a special introduction to Compass? And uh, No, 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 uh, no. I... I, I, I... <laughs> I, I gave it. I gave it. I think um, a, a good mm -hmm. good titles. Uh, last last week we looked at graphic statics, which I would say is kind of white box structural design. And um, uh, today the focus will be on 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 open source computation. So uh, an attitude to sharing, collaborating, and so on. But uh, Tom is the expert, so let's not take too many minutes away from him. Uh, I just okay. thought I joined in in case there is a final discussion or something like that. So I'll just uh, sit in in the back. But uh, Tom has the lead today. Good. So uh, Tom, uh, the screen is yours. Welcome. It looks like Tom is frozen, but uh, I'm <laughs> sure he will come back. Yes, we are waiting for a little bit. So please, uh, uh, maybe I adding something to Tom. Uh, uh, oh, okay, Tom, Tom Van Malis. Is back. He is actually the senior scientist and uh, the co-director of a Brock Research Group, ETH, and the leading developer of Compass. So uh, today, uh, uh, I think uh, Tom will introduce this open source computational framework to us. Welcome, Tom. The screen is yours. Hi. Thank you, Philip. Um, yeah, I'm going to indeed share my screen. Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, what I will try to do is give you a little bit an, an uh, overview of Compass, um, not not necessarily only through a long lecture, uh, but also a little bit, um, a few examples and and some uh, live demos. Um, since the 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 lecture is or the the presentation is recorded, I'm gonna maybe here and there go a little bit too fast for for. Uh, for you to necessarily follow hands-on, uh, but you can always do this afterwards. I'll give you also a little bit of, of uh, a code snippets and, and a few files to start from if you're interested afterwards. Um, but just so you know, you don't have to necessarily try to follow now. 
Um, okay, so um, yeah, what is Compass? Uh, that's maybe a good place to start. Uh, so it is like uh, what Philip said, an open source framework for computational research and collaboration in uh, our industry. So the architecture, engineering and construction industry and this little F in between brackets there is for fabrication. I know that this is usually, I guess, assumed to be part of the construction um, uh, uh, aspect of the industry, but I think it's, it somehow merits uh, its own place in this acronym. Um, Compass is built on, on three or so to achieve um, this this um, collaboration between all of the multiple multidisciplinary stakeholders in our industry compass is built on uh, three main principles um so this uh, you see them here so dry and we add this o um, dry means do not repeat yourself and the o is for others uh, to share your work and three collaborate um what what do we mean exactly by this um so the DRY um, means basically to provide you with tools that allow you to reuse your own code uh, very flexibly, but also the code and the developments from people in your group, in your department, in your institute, people you collaborate with. Um, uh, but not only that, but also um, uh, to, to be able to have access to all of the many, many libraries that already exist around the world that have been developed by people before you and that uh, are sometimes not so easy to use um, and so that we make available in a very accessible way. And then share your work is, is basically, um, uh, so Compose is set up so, so that there are no constraints in um, uh, using it in, in either a, a for personal work, for academic work, or for commercial work, um, and so that you can freely exchange with people um, in, in the easiest way possible. And then uh, collaborate, um, of course, is that the entire system is set up so that you can not only collaborate with, with uh, the people closest around you, but also, and this is important, of course, if you want to make a change in the industry, that you can very easily collaborate with uh, with uh, with people from the industry. So um, uh, the the not only in academia but also in the professional practice. What is important there in all of these aspects is that um, uh, architecture, engineering, and construction is 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 famously multidisciplinary, and so people from many many different backgrounds and with different levels of programming skills and educational backgrounds and, and academia or not academia and so on and so on, have to be able to collaborate and work together. So the entire framework is, is built to facilitate uh, this exchange and to, to, to simplify this collaboration. Um, and so one of the, the key components in that is that we very deliberately uh, built the entire framework from the start um, uh, around Python. Um, this is not only because Python is um, uh, well, a, a relatively easy language that had that uh, or to learn that uh, can be used by people with various skill uh, programming skills and, and backgrounds in, in, in programming and, 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 um, and, and working with computers in general. Uh, but also, of course, because Python comes with already a lot of tools built in that are extremely useful um, in, in the everyday tasks that we have to tackle. Um, the second thing is that Python is an ideal glue language uh, to interact with all of these libraries that are already available around the world, like things like libigl, Seagal, Gmesh, Open Cascade, OpenGL, and so on. They're all written in different languages than Python itself, um, uh, and they're notoriously difficult to use, even install on your computer. Uh, but through Compass uh, and with Python as a glue, again, um, we, we try to make this extremely easy so that uh, these, these libraries can be used in your everyday work. Uh, and then the third aspect of this is that um, not only is Python a good glue language between libraries and different languages, but also is um, uh, the ideal way to connect the various softwares of our industry. So many of these softwares like Rhino, even 3DEC nowadays, Blender, of course, they have um, they have even Python as an as a scripting language built in. But almost almost all softwares in our industry, um, even if they don't have this this very tight connection to to Python, they allow um, uh, or they have an API that can be accessed uh, through this language. So, 
Python provides, in, in that sense, the ideal starting point to build a, a framework that is um, not only open source, but also multidisciplinary, connects the dots between the different uh, tools and tool chains of our industry and can be used on all platforms. Uh, and with that, we've built um, the Compass ecosystem and the Compass ecosystem currently looks more or less like this. Uh, somebody... <laughs> I don't know what these errors are about, but um, um, so the, the ecosystem uh, consists out of this top part, uh, which we call the core framework, and then the bottom part, uh, uh, what, what is, <laughs> okay, whatever. Um, uh, the, the top part is uh, what we call the core framework. So this is um, the core libraries, the, the CAD interfaces, the links to external software, and so on. And then um, uh, at the bottom here, you see all of the extensions that, that we've built around this that, that are um, geared towards particular applications in the AAC industry. So I'll first walk you through this core framework. So the top part, the core framework itself has, let's say, a core library, um, which is uh, the Compass library. Um, this library has a lot of uh, different sub packages. I'm not going to go through all of them, but what is, of course, very important for um, a, a framework like Compass to be able to be standalone and be independent of, of additional software is that it has a, a, a robust geometry kernel. Um, so, and with a geometry kernel, I mean like a library that gives you primitives, shapes, uh, algorithms to operate on these things. Um, uh, um, uh, even NURBS geometry, BREPS, and so on and so on. Um, then there is uh, arguably the most important part of the entire framework, which is um, uh, the data structures. So these you see here on the right. Yeah, so I, I apologize for these two arrows. I don't know if you also see this. I don't know why and how they appeared here, um, uh, but I can seem to not be able to get rid of them. Maybe if I refresh my screen. No. Um, yeah. Um, so the 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 arguably the most important part are the data structures. You see them here on the right. I'll go in more detail uh, through them uh, later on. Uh, but so at the moment, it suffices to say that there are let's say four types of data structures in the framework. At the top here, you see uh, graphs and networks. Um, here, this stripe thing is half edge uh, mesh data structure. This uh, cellular thing is a vol mesh, which is the cellular translation of a half edge data structure. And here at the bottom um, is the assembly data structure. And again, we'll go uh, we'll look at this a little bit more detail later on. Um, and then this is actually uh, currently a relic that will um, move to its own um, um, uh, package, uh, which is Compass Robot. So I'll not dive into that too much. It's not because we're removing this from the framework, but it will have its own place uh, among uh, the, the core packages. Uh, so that's the core. The core provides all of the all of the base functionality. Um, so all of the um, all of the infrastructure, let's say, then there are these bindings, right? So, and the bindings, they provide this easy access to all of the external libraries that I uh, talked about yesterday, uh, uh, or, sorry, earlier. Um, so that means easy access to Seagull, to Gmesh, LipIGL, OCC, and Triangle. Uh, and what we do there is uh, like uh, the, one of the core principles uh, do not repeat yourself or others. Um, we also try to reuse as much as possible the functionality that is already out there. Um, and especially for things that um, are not so easy to implement in Python. So for example, um, from Compass C or through Compass Seagull, we get from Seagull, we get Boolean operations, we get slicing um, uh, uh, algorithms and so on. From Compass Gmesh, we get sophisticated um, uh, meshing algorithms, so for finite element meshing and, um, and, and similar applications. Um, LipIGL and Triangle we don't use so often anymore, but uh, what is a, a new addition and a very co important component at the moment is uh, OCC, so Compass OCC, which provides uh, a wrapper for the Open Cascade library, and this provides uh, support for NURBS curves and NURBS surfaces and uh, BREPs, so boundary representations, uh, independent of Rhino. So this you can then use anywhere where you can use Compass. Um, 
There is a bunch of visualization tools, which I'm not going to go through, but important for uh, you guys and for, for the people in, in, in our industry in general is, of course, these links to CAD tools. The, the, um, the three tools that you see here, Blender, GH, Python, and Rhino, um, are tools that we specifically support. Um, that does not mean that you can use Compass only with those tools. Um, you can use Compass in any environment where uh, Python is supported, but for these three, we provide specific support. So that means that we make it extremely easy to work with uh, Rhino, Rhino geometry, Rhino objects, uh, Rhino data, the same for Blender, the same for GH Python, GH Python so that um, uh, yeah, working with Compass in, in these three is, is extremely, extremely simple. Um, yeah, and then what I said earlier, what is important is to acknowledge that in our in 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 our field, in our industry, is that or in our industry that there are many fields that it's highly multidisciplinary. That um, a lot of people um, work on different platforms. They don't necessarily use CAD tools, uh, let alone Grasshopper, for example. Um, and so Compass is made such that with a few simple commands, you can set it up on Windows, on Mac, on Linux. Uh, you can use it standalone with these CAD tools uh, in whichever constellation you like. And um, the, the, what is important there again is that we've taken a lot of effort to, and that's what I meant with this specific support for particular tools, is that whether you're working in, in Blender or in Rhino or in Grasshopper, uh, the code that you use is almost exactly the same, if not exactly the same. So the, there is um, there is al always only a few lines necessary to visualize something, to load data, to work with data, and so on. Um, and what what is uh, immediately out of the box is there is that um, you can start also because because of uh, using Compass as a, as a central hub between all of these tools, you can very easily start to exchange data between, for example, Blender and Rhino, which is not typically an easy thing to do. So for example, here, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll run this example uh, live. Um, yeah, I, for those of you who know Blender a little bit, uh, Blender has this sample geometry, which is this monkey head. Um, so with a very simple script, you take the monkey head out, you can serialize this to a session file. You bring this monkey into Rhino, uh, you define a, a NURBS curve there, and then you take the NURBS curve and the monkey out of um, uh, Rhino and Blender and put it in the viewer, and then um, let this monkey slide over that. Uh, over that curve in 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 so outside of these two tools. So I know that this is an extremely contrived example, but the point is to show that with Compass as a as a central hub, that it's very easy to move data around between different platforms, different tools, different softwares, and so on. Um, so to really quickly uh, show you this, um, uh, oh sorry, I'm gonna clear this and maybe make it a bit bigger so you can properly see. Right, so what I meant with easy install is indeed that um, uh, installing Compass is, is extremely simple. So you typically would create an environment. Um, so I'll make a Tongv environment. I hope that I spelled this correct. And then um, add like um, uh, a version of uh, Python that I want to work with and then say, okay, I want to install Compass. And then I just say yes, so that, um, I don't have to uh, confirm that I would want to actually install all of these things. And then it depends a little bit on your internet connection, how fast this goes. Uh, so usually during presentations, this is a little bit slower because I'm already eating up a lot of the bandwidth. Um, but so it will um, install a lot of uh, uh, packages. So uh, yeah, maybe that was an important aspect. So we distribute all of this through Anaconda. Um, which makes it extremely easy to install all of these things, and you get that entire Python uh, Python ecosystem together um, uh, with with an install. So now, once we um, activate our Tongg environment and we launch a Python interpreter, we can import uh, Compass and uh, check you know, the first time. This always takes a while, uh, and then uh, check, for example, which version we installed. Voila. Um, so just, just to show you uh, how easy it is to get it installed, um, then to install it for Rhino, you just do compass rhino.install and you can potentially um, uh, install it for a particular version and then it will run um, uh, a few commands. Um, I can do that maybe quickly now. I'll set it back to the environment that I typically use because otherwise um, some of the examples that I want to show will not work. Um, 
to yeah, voila. so this installs then uh, a few packages uh, it will install immediately also a few pre pre-compiled user components and then you can start using compass uh, I'll switch back to my development environment um uh, Kunda activate uh, compass uh, dev and then um uh, reinstall uh, the tools there you'll see that um yeah I have in my environment a bunch of uh, a lot of other tools um and then also already a few uh, uh, um, uh, uh, plugins uh, graphical user interfaces I'll show this as examples later on um, but so just to just to show you that if you have an environment installed uh, that installing this for Rhino Grasshopper and Blender and these kind of things is extremely easy right and then once um you have done that um you can then start using it either in 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 rhino or uh standalone as i said um sorry i'm trying to find my screens yeah so uh, here i uh, I'll, I'll share this code with you afterwards um, i've made like this this monkey uh example so this for example you can very easily um quickly run in blender um i'm gonna open this file code this is from a workshop i gave a few days ago so if we now run this so you see that um again everything very easy very simple to do um we we created here this monkey head um i added one level of subdivision i mean we could add two levels of subdivisions uh, if we if we want Sorry. Okay. Let me drag my screen. Okay. Um, right, so here uh, we added another level of subdivision. We exported this to a data file. We dumped this to the dot. And then with the artist, I just visualized um, uh, the, the geometry so we could see what we're doing. If then in the meantime, uh, we have Rhino open, new model, perspective here we have here this uh, our monkey so I'm gonna just run this script as well um sorry. monkey rhino where's my monkey oh, yeah Voila, now our monkey is here. And so we could then now say, okay, here we want this monkey to slide over. Oh, sorry, turn off this auto. Slide over this uh, this this curve. Uh, so we will export uh, the curve here with this uh, with this file. So run script. Um, select the curve. Voila, the curve is exported. And now basically we can here take um, in uh, VS Code, so we've already taken the monkey from Blender, we've put it in Rhino, that was actually not really necessary, but just to show that it's possible. Uh, we've defined the curve there, we've um, loaded this curve into the same data file, and then here we can then continue working with um, the, um, the data that we've uh, been exchanging. So here it is opened in a different screen. So here is our monkey already aligned to our curve. And then in the next one, um, we just make our monkey slide over that curve. Oh, sorry, you don't see this, but it's happening here. Um, just so, just to show you, like with a, a few, a few, a few simple scripts, um, uh, you can quickly exchange, uh, or you can install Compass. You can install it for Blender. You can install it for Rhino. You have a standalone viewer. You can exchange data between all of these things. Go back and forth um and uh work in in a very um unlimited uh, or unconstrained unlimited way okay um again this went a little bit fast i am sure but um you can go through this uh at your own pace afterwards in the recording um so this is what you get from the core framework you get data structures geometry uh, nerves geometry boundary representations an easy way to exchange data and so on um and then on top of that, we've built all of these extensions, right? And these extensions, they are grouped into, let's say, um, uh, clusters that address particular 
um, challenges or applications in our um, in of the, of the AAC industry. So, for example, there is a bunch of packages related to digital fabrication. Some of you will already know Compass Fab, uh, um, developed by the Kamatsu Color Research. Um, which is a package for working with robots. RRC is uh, something similar. Uh, Slicer, for example, is for um, uh, working with additive manufacturing processes. And then uh, Compass Wood and Compass Timper provide ways for working with wood. And then Compass Vol is like a volumetric modeling tool uh, that, again, uh, provides a lot of tools for additive manufacturing processes. Something that we are very um, uh, involved in, and that actually is the origin uh, of the Compass framework uh, when it was still the BRG in-house framework, um, is related to form finding, of course. Um, uh, there, uh, there are a lot of packages like Compass FD, Compass DR, um, Compass SEM, Compass AGS, uh, DNA, 3GS. I think Philip maybe have shown has shown you already um, a few things here on the bottom, or at least talked about them. So these are graphic statics uh, based tools. The ones on the top are, um, are solvers based on force density, dynamic relaxation, and then uh, combi combinatorial equilibrium modeling. Um, something that uh, we have been releasing in, in recent years are tools related to masonry assessment. Uh, so here you see a bunch of solvers that can be used to address or assess various aspects of the equilibrium of uh, discrete element assemblies. Either it's RBE, um, CRA, PRD, 3DEC, TNO, and they all use an assembly data structure as their, um, let's say, central data management uh, hub. Uh, I'll also talk a little bit more about this uh, later. Uh, and then there is uh, what is, I guess, also relevant for, for, for many of you is the uh, Compass FEA2, which is a toolbox for uh, finite element analysis and finite element modeling, which allows you to, through one modeling language and through one um, uh, uh, scripting language, let's say, um, to use different uh, FE softwares in the background uh, and ex interchangeably. So you can make one problem definition, one um, uh, one model and then run this either with Sophistic or Open Seas or uh, Abacus or, and in the future also Ashtab uh, and Ansys and so on. Um, all right, so that's that's a, in a in a very very brief nutshell an overview of uh, this ecosystem that we've created. Um, as you've seen also in the very quick examples that I've shown is that everything is very, um, let's say, code-oriented or scripting-oriented until now. Um, and that's, of course, not something for everyone. Um, uh, uh, maybe, yeah, okay, maybe uh, one thing, though, still, is that uh, what you can also very easily do, um, because that's always a question that people have, is is use uh, compass in relation with grasshopper right so this once uh, it's it's uh, installed for rhino um and i'm telling you this because it's like a, a like halfway between let's say graphical user interface tools and and scripting um as soon as compass is installed for rhino you can also use it in grasshopper you see that also there are already a few components that are pre-installed. Uh, so there are a few base Compass components that are automatically installed. And then Compass Fab actually comes with an entire toolbox of um, uh, Grasshopper um, uh, components. Um, but you can actually, um, the, the easiest way or the, the most straightforward way is to just use it directly into um, a, a, grass, a Grasshopper um, um, a Python component. And so there it's as simple as, um, remember here this, this this little script, right? So this we can actually even just copy paste more or less uh, into this component. And so the only thing that I'm going to write, because that actually does not really work, I'm just going to add compass to this from obj and then say compass.get. This get function gives you access to a lot of sample data, sample files. Um, and so if I'm not a grasshopper expert in in any way, I actually had to try this yesterday to make sure that this would work for the for the workshop. But as you can see, um, uh, so whether you write in grasshopper or in Rhino or in Blender, the code is always the same, um, and you get um, uh, uh, easy access to to all of these things. And this concept of an artist, you see that here. Actually, there is also nothing that says that I'm working grasshopper. Uh, so if you run this in, in Rhino, it will give you exactly the same result. And if you run this in Blender, it will also give you exactly the same result. Um, okay. Um, 
but so again, this is all there is. This is a lot of scripting, a lot of um, uh, coding, and that is not always something that is easy for people to start with. And acknowledging that, um, we have um, uh, developed an entire framework on in our framework, let's say, for making CAD plugins and tools. And so the, the idea there is that um, since everything is built based on the Compass framework uh, as, as a central or as a, as a core um, infrastructure, and then you use a lot of the additional extension packages, for example, the TNA package or triangle or skeleton or whatnot, and then a, a light UI layer, then you can make um, uh, with pure Python code and using only bits and pieces of the Compass framework, um, you can make tools like Renovol 2, which I guess uh, some of you will know, um, but which then give access to uh, TNA and a lot of uh, these other packages, but through a graphical user interface rather than through scripting. What is important there is that this is very extendable. So because it is all based on the Compass uh, framework, you can take the data that you generate through these graphical user interfaces, take that out, work, uh, continue working with this uh, and so on. And, and this is something that I'll actually show you with uh, Nit Candela as an example. Uh, but maybe as a last remark about these CAD interfaces is that we've released already a few tools like this, but uh, currently we're reworking that entire ecosystem to make this uh, even easier and reusable and, and simpler to combine um, uh, many different bits and pieces. Um, and the first tool we've released like this is Form Finder. Um, uh, which we will, uh, which I'll, I'll show you interactively in Rhino in, in a few minutes. Um, and Form Finder is basically a tool that um, uses uh, the force density method and the dynamic relaxation method uh, together with uh, data structures and the data exchange mechanisms and so on and so on of the Compass framework to give you access to this mixed tension compression form finding uh, and soon actually also bending active elements. Uh, and what I will show you is uh, how you can very easily use something like this to, um, uh, uh, or use these tools to develop uh, something like, for example, the geometry of Nit Candela. Uh, so through the form finding, but also um, what I will then do is take the data out and then uh, add a few fabrication elements to that data, uh, just to show you that uh, again, through this flexible exchange of information that you can um, set up extremely um, uh, powerful project delivery mechanisms and, and, and workflows. So what we will do is basically form find the geometry and then I'll show you in a few scripts how to actually add these bumps to this so that you get this corrugated shell um, that all the way to uh, generating an FE mesh for this that you can then um, uh, analyze with Compass FEA2. Um, maybe before I do that, uh, very briefly, um, again about these data structures. So what I said was that there are three core data structures, right? So the network uh, mesh and a vol mesh. So the network here on the left, what you have to, uh, or what what, what that what, what the network actually is, is just a connection of nodes by edges, right? And so what these kind of data structures provide you is, for example, uh, relationships uh, between uh, connected elements. Um, so this allows you to find, for example, for a given node, its neighbors, um, but also, for example, a path uh, between two uh, nodes in, in, um, in, in a connected constellation of nodes. Uh, and this, of course, here is maybe still a little bit trivial, but if you look at a network like this, then you see that um, what, what the point of having these kind of data structures is. So it's absolutely not trivial to find a path in 3D uh, between two points in this kind of connected set of lines. Um, maybe a little bit more tangible, uh, what networks are uh, also very useful for is form finding. Uh, so cable nets are a very natural fit for these kind of networks because cable nets are basically uh, essentially nodes connected by edges. And so um, they lend themselves very well to, uh, for example, uh, for density or dynamic relaxation based form finding. The geometry that you see here is the one from uh, the Hilo um, uh, project. Um, but so because these data structures are extremely flexible, you can also start to tag on all sorts of information related to fabrication, um, uh, the geometry of the nodes, this orientation of, of, of that little rod here, and, and so on and so on. Uh, but also, for example, to organize um, the, 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 uh, the strands in a, in a knitted formwork, like in Knit Candela, so the warp and the weft direction, again, uh, lend itself um, uh, very easily to be uh, encoded into this uh, network data structure. Uh, I mean, many other uh, applications are possible, but so these are a few examples. 
The uh, half edge mesh data structure is um, uh, the the concept of this is here illustrated above. I, it's it's a bit too, or we we don't have enough time to go into detail about this. But basically, uh, what a half edge uh, means is that every edge has two half edges that point in opposite directions, and each of these half edges point to a face. And because of that, uh, because of this consistent cycling of the faces throughout the entire data structure, you can very easily uh, traverse uh, that data structure very efficiently. And so this, um, again, gives you access to these kind of things like neighborhoods and, and connections and, and things that you would get also from a network or a graph and find paths between two points, uh, but also to start to compute the normals on a surface um uh, or the normals of the faces or uh, find loops um or strips on uh, on a on a surface uh, so um these are all topological relationships between the elements of of these things uh, of of um uh, of of the components of of these kind of the, of of surf um sorry <laughs> these kind of surfaces and these these uh, topological relationships they provide the building blocks for all sorts of algorithms uh, so where you can, for example, here quickly triangulate, um, remesh, find the dual, um, apply a certain subdivision algorithm to create a frame, give that a certain thickness, and then uh, continue by analyzing this within a fee um, solver or something like that. Um, meshes are also a little bit everywhere. So for example, the form of force diagrams that are used for the form finding of um, the armadillo vault are based on meshes. Um, a lot of aspects of Hilo were based on meshes. So here, for example, all of the fabric-related uh, aspects of the development of Hilo were uh, mesh-based. Um, but also the, the buildup of the layers, so all of the data related to um, the foam blocks, the, the connectors between the different layers of the Hilo uh, roof were all encoded on this data structure. Uh, and again, many, many uh, different applications are possible. Then the third one is the full mesh. The full mesh is a half phase data structure. Um, it's a bit of a difficult concept, but it's literally the 3D translation of this half edge. So instead of half edges pointing at faces, now you have half cells, uh, half faces pointing at cells. Um, and so there again, uh, because of this relationship between elements, you can very easily traverse uh, through a cellular data structure um, uh, uh, in, a, in a very efficient way. There are not so many applications for this. Uh, it's a very cool data structure, but yeah, the applications are limited. So far, we've actually only used this for 3D graphic statics. Uh, so here you see um, actually the unified uh, form force diagram of the Myco tree, which is something that then Juni, based on these tools, developed for the Soul Biennale uh, in 2017 or something like this. Um, but again, I, I cannot point at too many other examples because there are not none. Um, so it's a very it's a very cool data structure, but it's it's um, yeah the, the use cases are limited. What is um, uh, very nice is that also these data structures can be combined. So for example, if you combine a network or a graph with a mesh data structure, you can start. Um, uh, um, uh, working with assemblies. So here you see this assembly data structure. Each of these blocks is encoded by a mesh, so by a half edge data structure. And then the relationships between the blocks are encoded by a graph uh, so that you can start to um, keep track of relationships in complex, complex discrete element models, like for example, the Armadillo Vault, um, but also for, for example, the Striatus Footbridge. Uh, so all of these are um, encoded in an assembly data structure, which keeps track of not only the individual pieces of um, uh, these structures, but also all of the information about how they are in contact with each other so that you can run uh, very efficiently um, uh, calculations on this or um, organize the fabrication data and so on. A last thing um, to point out is that this data exchange, um, so the the uh, the the um, the flexibility of these data structures um, is also part of this data exchange. So what I showed you earlier with this monkey head and the, and the curve, uh, these were geometry objects, but this is also true for the data structures. So these can also be very flexibly moved around regardless of how much data you, uh, sorry, this point is supposed to be here somewhere, um, regardless of how much data you actually store on them. So here you see one node of uh, the data structure of the Hilo um, uh, cable net. 
and you see all sorts of additional um, information being stored of them on them and this information can then through the same mechanism that I showed earlier with this monkey then be exchanged between uh, calculation tools like Sophistic here on the top or Rhino here for the form finding or then Blender where we used uh, the control algorithms or then here uh, on the bottom left is again Rhino, but then with a lot of fabrication data. So all of this is stored on one data structure that can be very flexibly um, uh, moved around um, between different compass packages, but also between different tools. Um, and actually also be used as a way to then communicate with uh, different stakeholders uh, and different collaborators in a project like this. Um, so that you can really, um, from this one data structure, organize all of the buildup of uh, layers uh, on site. Um, uh, so that um, uh, yeah, it, it contained into one one ba basically one data container, and without loss of information when you communicate between all these processes, um, all the way from uh, here building up the, the the base layers to then even the insulation and the, the weatherproofing layers uh, that go on top. Um, so that's a little bit in a nutshell um, uh, what what Compass does and provides. And what I was gonna, what I said well, that we were gonna do was uh, use FormFinder a little bit interactively, and then take the data out, um, and then uh, work a little bit on this um, uh, uh, Nit Candela geometry. I'll do this quickly because Philip told me that I should leave some time for questions. Again, I know that this is rather fast, but it's difficult to give you an overview um, otherwise. Um, so as um, I told you earlier, when we installed um, uh, Rhino, um, Compass for Rhino, a lot of other things were also installed automatically. So for example, here, this Fofin uh, plugin was also installed. And so, which means that now um, I have here uh, a form finder toolbar and actually also a core compass toolbar and actually nowadays also an uh, IGS2 toolbar um, uh, and uh, hopefully by next week because uh, Juice needs this for teaching a new Rhino Vault 2 toolbar and so the idea is that now you can um, uh, really very easily use all of these tools together, exchange data between them, and so on and so on. Uh, I'm not going to do this IGS2 thing. I'm just going to show you FormFinder. Um, and so working with FormFinder, um, even though that... So everything that you see now, this uh, everything behind the buttons, is basically Python code that uses the Compass framework in the background. Um, so what we will do is basically quickly make a, a mesh grid and then oh, sorry, an extent, so, uh, identify the anchors. Uh, so we're gonna identify here the corners of our structure and that's actually already enough. And then we can already run this FD solver and this um, uh, is basically uh, the result. So a lot of stuff happened actually, um, we, uh, communicated in the background with, uh, a, for some of you who know a little bit about uh, uh, um, the technicalities of Rhino and then um, uh, Python in Rhino and so on. Uh, uh, Rhino has uh, Iron Python, so that means things like NumPy and so on and so on are not available. The force density method is entirely based on um, uh, on the force on on NumPy and and SciPy and and a few other things, um, and so we. We basically ran now this solver by communicating with a little server that uh, was automatically started when we launched these two toolbars so that we can use things like NumPy and SciPy and so on uh, without actually having to exit Rhino. And as you can see, this communication runs extremely fast um, uh, because it, the result is there instantaneously. And then we can start um, to move stuff around. So again, all of this is, there are no compiled plugins or something like this in the background. This is all pure Python code. The same code that you would use in a script or in um, the tools that I shown earlier. Um, so this is now our little high par. Um, maybe we want to start to um, scale the force densities a little bit. So we're gonna select um, here, maybe these two boundaries, and then we're gonna scale the force densities, voila, so a bit like this. Um, we can add uh, constraints. So we're gonna add maybe a curve for this guy and a line for that guy. And then we're gonna um, 
constrain our vertices uh, to that. Oh, sorry, manual selections, select this guy onto that curve, and then do this again, constrain uh, manual this guy onto this curve. Okay, and now we run this again. And now we get already a constrained result where basically this point has to slide over this curve and this point has to slide over that curve. And you see that our reaction forces basically are perpendicular to the curve in that point. So there are no residual forces. And this is like a rail, let's say that uh, our point slides over. Um, you can then um, start playing around um, with um, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, so for example, you can also here now say, yes, but I want these things to actually maybe be compression arches. So now I'm just gonna scale it in the opposite direction. No, he's not happy yet. Right. Ah, okay, that was maybe not what was supposed to happen here. Um, sorry, I wanted to show you a compression example, but apparently it was not as simple as that. Um, I'll quickly clear the scene, get rid of these two guys here, and then do our mesh grid again. Um, uh, and then um, select a few anchor points. I'm going to do this manual now, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. Something like this, I think. Um, uh, apply for sensitivity to this, yeah. And then now, um, I think I have to add a, anyway. Wait, I'm gonna, because I'm already running behind schedule here, I'm just gonna quickly go skip to the Nit Candela thing. Um, so here, yes, clear. I already prepared um, like a boundary condition for this. Uh, here, Nit Candela open. So this, this is kind of like the boundary condition of uh, Nit Candela, right? And so what we could now do is uh, start to do some constraint form finding in a similar way. Um, so here, I have to make a cylinder first quickly. Um, grid snap. I'm going to make this cylinder like that. And then give it the correct height. Uh, um, we're going to make our network now from um, this cylinder, so I'm going to do 36 and I don't know, um, 19 or something like this. So, um, so now we have um, uh, this cylinder, then we're going to select, select all of the boundary edges, yeah, that's enough, and then run this. So now we get something like that. That's obviously not yet Nit Candela, but now we can start um, uh, assigning um, a constraint. So constraining the, the, these points to those boundary curves and you'll quickly start to see it emerge. And then I'll load a file that, um, that I already pre-prepared. So here, for example, we could say that here, these guys, we're now gonna constrain to, so this, this guy, oh, sorry, manual. Uh, this guy here, this guy here, this guy here, we're going to constrain uh, to this curve. We could already run this again. And then uh, we have that little foot already that um, uh, Nit Candela there has. Um, sorry. Um, then uh, constrain more. Sorry, it's zoom X. Extends. Um, constrain more points here. Where are we? Uh, manual. This guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy onto that curve. And then here also, uh, here, um, manual, constrain, manual, this, this, and this onto this curve and then run form finding again. 
so this you can now keep doing uh, until um, you basically get to something like what I already prepared. Um, so the Nitkandela. Right, so I, when you keep doing this, you basically end up with something like that. And all of the blue points are now constrained to uh, these curves, right? And um, when you load a file, it assumes that you uh, that equilibrium is not yet established, let's say. Um, so you have to rerun it again, and then you get this as an equilibrium geometry. What is then nice, uh, and that was kind of the point of what I wanted to show you, is that you can then export this uh, data. Um, so you can say, for example, that you want to use this cable mesh JSON um, to uh, work or to continue work outside of Rhino, or actually, for that matter, inside of Rhino. Um, so here, this is cable mesh JSON that I um, uh, previously already saved, and we're going to resave it now. Um, and then this guy. Uh, where's my screen? So, and again, I'll give you all of this, all of these files, so you can run this for yourself afterwards. Um, so, what I prepared here are a few files that take this Nitkandela data. So, so, you see here this cable mesh JSON that we just produced, and the first file will just uh, visualize this again to make sure that um, uh, we we have actually extracted the data that we wanted. So, here is uh, this uh, uh, Nitkandela geometry that we just form found. Um, and that we export it. And so, again, you can use an artist to then do this in Blender or do this in Rhino. I'm just now going to do this in um, in the viewer just to show you that whether you started in Rhino or came from Rhino or moved to somewhere else, um, you can move data around very flexibly. Um, the second uh, thing here is just going to create a little intro dos. Um, I'll exp oh, no, it's going to thicken the mesh. Uh, so this always opens in a different screen. So right, what we did now was basically already create like the full shell thickness, but that's not really what we want in the end, right? Because if you look at uh, this thing here, we want to make a waffle shell. So what I did now was basically create the full thickness, but we want to eat away now these, um, these, um, uh, these little parts here. Um, so that's, but you see, but you see that, uh, I mean, there are a lot of comments in the file, but the actual code is extremely simple. There is just here mesh thicken. And then I save this again in a file. I dump this to this session so that the next uh, script can actually just load this session, get um, uh, my my cable mesh again. Uh, here, we're going to add an intro DOS uh, to, to our session file. So here, if you run this, we get now our uh, thickened mesh and I added a little offset um, towards the inside so that when I create a little box here now that it leaves um, like a sufficient uh, thickness uh, on, on the outside, let's say, so that we have a shell with these corrugations. Um, again, creating this offset is very easy. We make a copy of the data structure. Uh, we just um, use the, the vertex location, the vertex normal, and then create a little offset that is the point plus the normal, and then the shell, uh, the total shell thickness. And then the rest of the script is again the, sh the same. So we add this to our session. We export this session again. Uh, and then the end is always a little bit of uh, visualization. And then this session, we can then um, load in our next script. Um, where we then load our cable mess, the intro does that we created, and now we're going to add the boxes. I added here a few commented um, uh, sections. You can try different versions. So either you use this or use that or use this. They will give different results. Um, but at the end of the day, we basically want to make a few um, uh, boxes um, uh, on top of our mesh that will then, um, or that we can then use used to eat eat away um, part of that concrete um, to create like this this uh, waffled um, uh, geometry. You see here that um, the boxes are actually not straight boxes. So I already did an offset of the face um, to leave space for the ribs and then create a little tapering kind of uh, so that the ribs are not straight, but that they become a little bit thicker towards their base. Um, 
right? So this is from that intrados. And then now the only thing we have to do is, um, uh, sorry, and then here again, it's it's the same principle always. You add this to our session file. We dump this um, uh, to, or we add this to the session. We dump this to a file. The rest is just visualization. And then in the next um, uh, step, we can basically again load our cable mesh, our introduce the parameters, the boxes, um, uh, the shell that we already had. You can also do this all in one script, of course, but, um, and, and in this case, that would of course be easy enough because you see that we always only need a few lines of code to, um, uh, to, 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 to generate uh, every single component of, of this thing. Uh, what we're gonna do here is from uh, Compass OCC, um, we're, going to make this into uh, a boundary representation because we can do cleaner booleans uh, on this without generating all sorts of triangulations and other artifacts. Um, so I'm going to make a compound um, out of all of these blocks and then basically subtract um, the, the, the blocks from the shell and then um, write this to a step file and um, visualize um, uh, this thing. Uh, so the, the, ripped, the ripped geometry, right? This takes a few seconds, uh, but it then also needs to do a lot of booleans. Um, it will show up very, very, very soon. Um, but again, it needs to subtract a lot of boxes um, from this geometry. Um, and it should appear now any second. <laughs> um, a second. Uh, it's the the thing that actually is slow is this part um uh because it it doesn't like yeah the, it's just how we set up the drawing of of b reps um it's it's um so the the step file is already written the it's currently actually basically making the the viewer geometry that is uh, something that we have to resolve but it's it's making an extremely fine mesh to represent this yeah, so now here you have it and so here you already see kind of like the ripped uh, geometry of uh, of nitcandela emerging right so we started from our form found cable mesh we gave that thing a thickness um we then did a little offset of our introdos we made these boxes um, and then we basically told um, uh, Compass to subtract now all of these boxes uh, from um, from that that thick geometry, and what we're left with is a very clean, very fine, um, very finely defined um, uh, ripped ripped geometry. And now you can start to do all sorts of things, right? Um, so we have we have our base our base geometry. We can work a bit on the visualization or start organizing the, the, the knitting data. Um, but um, we can also start now doing the analysis of this, um, of this shell geometry uh, that we've generated. And this is what I here added in the last two files. Uh, so the first one actually adds like this colorful uh, knit candela knit on the, on the inside. It's a bit just to show you that you can, um, um yeah combine these two and then get to uh, something that starts to look sorry i have a bit of a cold um yeah, so again it's drawing this thing it doesn't like drawing uh, these very fine b-reps but that's uh, something that we just have to oh it's where is my view now oh sorry there it is Right, so what we have now is um, something that already starts to look at uh, maybe a different interpretation of knit candela. So we have our knit on the inside, and we have our um, uh, shell on the outside. Right, so all of the detail is in there. All of the uh, the waffle geometry um, of the shell, and then um, the Um, and then the um, uh, the the knitted the the knitted inside. Okay, so and then as a last step there, we can then generate, as I said, um, again through. I mean, I do want to emphasize how simple the code is to now generate an extremely fine FE mesh for this. Um, so you see here, we again just take our data out of this session file that we've created. Um, we make uh, a gmesh mesh model out of this um, we set a certain uh, maximum size for our model 
we just ask the model to generate a mesh to optimize it and then to convert it to um, a, a, a compass uh, mesh. And then here we just visualize it. And so this is then the result of that, right? Where you get then an extremely fine, well-organized, um, high quality of fee mesh um, from, um, uh, from our shell geometry that you can now put in Compass of VA uh, to analyze the behavior and the response of these things to various load cases. So um, again, I maybe went a little bit fast, but just to say that um, we, we did in, let's say, less than 10 minutes, um, the form finding, the fabrication data, the shell geometry, the, um, well, not the fabrication data, but the shell geometry, the FE model, uh, and the start for generating the fabrication data of um, a project like Nate Candela. Uh, I mean, of course, there is a lot of refinement uh, that still needs to be added, but just to show you that um, by simply exchanging data first from Rhino to now uh, outside to VS Code and then moving this around between a few very, very simple scripts where uh, there is actually more lines of visualization code and, and imports than actual, actual doing. Um, we already uh, actually defined a quite sophisticated geometry and converted this uh, to something that now can be run um, uh, through Abacus or um, uh, any other F FE solver. Um, Maybe as a last uh, thing there is that um, what I also pre-configured to be in this environment that you will get um, uh, uh, when I make this uh, folder available for you is, um, so these environment files, um, you can just uh, install by saying, so instead of this com co compass, uh, conda create environment and then install compass and uh, compass v2 and compass OCC and doing all of this, you can also just say conda create an environment from this environment file and then this environment file will already install compass a particular version seagull occ view 2 and then a bunch of other packages and so what i included here also um, for you is not only the stuff that is needed for the form finding which is this um, but also compass assembly and compass cra and what uh, you can then do with that is um start playing around with um, uh, discrete element modeling and the CRA um, uh, the CRA solver. So here you see, for example, a custom viewer with a little stack here. I mean, this is a bit boring, of course, because of course the stack is stable, uh, but you can then here start to um, maybe say, okay, uh, I want to move the blocks of my stack uh, around a bit. And then, um, Oh, sorry. Uh, and then uh, analyze this again. And so we start to get this tower of pizza kind of pizza kind of situation where you see that um, uh, earlier the resultant forces were all nice through the middle of all of these interfaces. And now you see that it starts to lean and that you start to get more forces on these corners here and that your resultant starts to move more towards this side. Um, of course, you all know that uh, since the blocks are size one, and since we have 10 blocks, that uh, we are getting close to um, the um, ultimate equilibrium state when we move, um, when we start to move um, about 10 centimeters per block, right? Because then here, the resultant force is going to start to get really, really close to this edge here. These forces are starting to become very small. Uh, I'll rescale this maybe a little bit so that you can see this better. Right, so these individual interfaces, uh, the um, the the resultant forces at the interfaces start to become very close to this edge here, and of course, once we push this over the edge, so for example, if we say eleven, then it will be just over it. <laughs> What is really cool is that um, even though that this problem actually doesn't work, um, right? Because there is no compression only equilibrium. Um, CRA is one of these solvers that um, gives you more than just a yes or no answer when it comes to uh, discrete element modeling. Um, it allows you to define like a penalty solve, uh, which, which basically means that it will try to see what, how many, how many tension forces are actually needed uh, or how little tension, or what is the minimum amount of additional helper forces, let's say, or penalty forces 
that are needed to still keep this thing in equilibrium. And so you see that even though that uh, this, this thing is not um, technically stable with only uh, compression contacts, it can tell you that if you add a little bit of um, restraint here, then actually this structure can be stable again. Uh, and you can, of course, push this then uh, to the extreme uh, or push this um, to the point where um, many of these interfaces will start to need this kind of help. Um, so here, <clears throat> right, so you see that the resultant forces, of course, start to move further and further uh, out, and uh, you will start to need more and more of these help forces. Of course, here, this for a stack like this, this is still uh, rather simple. So I also added um, uh, an arch for you. Um, yeah. um, where here um, you can start to appreciate um, actually how this this uh, this structure needs to stand or wants to stand. So you see here that um, the green line actually um, you could consider kind of like a thrust line or like the thrust line, and you see that it starts. So this is really at the edge. It starts to touch the boundary here and the boundary there. I think there are no tension forces yet here. No, but I think maybe here. So if I increase the scale, I think you will already start to see uh, here. So this you can start to interpret as a hinge opening up. Um, and yeah, sorry, this is not very interpretable, uh, but you can start to see how this structure needs to stand and um, how you can, for example, um, investigate like if your arch maybe has a very different thickness maybe the rise is uh, like four um how that affects um uh, how how this thing how this thing works right so here you see very clearly what i meant earlier with the green line that it starts to show you like a th one of the thrust lines uh, into this geometry um, since these thrusts, these these resultant forces don't hit the interfaces perpendicularly, you also see that uh, you start to engage friction at the interfaces. That's these blue lines. So again, um, uh, with with only uh, a bunch of um, uh, compost packages in the background, you see that the only thing that we installed here are um, uh, a bunch of uh, yeah compost things. This you can, by the way, there is also. There are also a few files that show you how to run this in Rhino. So it's not uh, because I now did this in the viewer uh, that this is limited to viewer. So again, you can start to exchange this and do this in all sorts of locations. There, the reason why there is a wall here is because we did a workshop uh, the other day where we used this to generate a wall um, structure. And then uh, with Gonzalo, I showed the students how to then use a robot to assemble this wall and assess the intermediate stability of um, the blocks while uh, you're doing that. Uh, assembly process. Um, yeah, I, I don't, um, I think um, this is more or less um, what, I mean, there, yeah, there are a lot of uh, other examples here that you could uh, try and run. And there is a, a big dome here. There is a cross fault in there. There is all of this wall stuff, um, the showing how to make uh, sections of of blocks um, uh, during a robotic assembly process. I don't know why this wall or the wall. Um, oh no, sorry, this dome. I think it has a little bit of problems with the interface. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So here is our dome, right? And so there again, uh, you have. Uh, yeah, sorry, I I wanted to show you maybe the assembly data structure. So what you see here is. Um, you have basically all of the blocks, right? Um, and every block is kind of like a mesh by itself. And uh, then you have the interfaces between the blocks, which is uh, which are these uh, little polygons uh, that you see. And then um, the, sorry, for every block, there is a node in this data structure. And then um, for every interface, there is an edge. And then this edge stores all sorts of information. And this is basically what is used to then um, to then run uh, the equilibrium analysis. So this, this basically is what I meant earlier with this combination of a graph. Uh, the graph has the nodes and the edges, and then the meshes are the individual blocks. This together forms an assembly data structure. And that is then uh, the basis for all of the masonry assessment. Um, 
Yeah, and this you can apply, of course, to all sorts of funky geometries. Here you have um, this this um, uh, cross fault. Uh, so there are in these packages there are always different different ways to um, to generate these kind of geometries. Uh, so here, for example, um, I uh, there is again this get uh, function to get a sample uh, data for the dome. This was generated from uh, like a dome uh, template. Uh, the arch was also generated from this arch template. So all of these packages also provide like easy ways to get started and uh, to explore uh, how all of these uh, all of these things uh, can come together. Um, yeah, I think maybe now is a good point to close off. Um, again, maybe it, I went a little bit fast, um, but it's then also a, by now a vast framework. Um, and um, yeah, I wanted to show you a little bit all sorts of things. So um, maybe to recap, uh, the, I guess there are two very important components to the framework, which is um, this um, uh, data exchange that I tried to illustrate with this monkey and, and then um, with Nick Candela. And then of course the data structures that allow you to uh, encode not only in these discrete assemblies, but also in uh, uh, things like Nitcandela or um, uh, in Rhino, in, in in vaulted structures or cable um, or, or things like Hilo, uh, store all sorts of additional information related to um, uh, fabrication uh, processes and, and and not so just not only the form finding and the analysis and uh, but basically everything in in one uh, data store. All right, um, yeah. I think that's about it. Um, are there any questions? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, introduce the, uh, the new framework, actually uh, make a, a lot advanced development uh, over the past few years. So we have some students here. Uh, could you uh, read the, the chat? Oh, yeah, in the group? chat, yeah. Um, uh, is it possible to use deep learning packages like PyTorch? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, so for example, uh, sorry, I have to read it out loud, of course. Um, so the question is, is it possible to use deep learning packages like PyTorch or TensorFlow with Compass? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, so one of our students, Mark Tam, um, he he uses um, uh, um, a lot of machine learning algorithms, or his, his PhD is about... Um, uh, using machine learning algorithms to uh, make some of the um, less obvious form finding methods a little bit more accessible by training uh, neural, neural networks to, um, to for example, to do faster best fitting or um, to um, make topological changes in, in diagrams and so on. Um, there are a lot of our students that you use PyTorch as a way to um, find gradients of functions uh, so to do the auto autograd uh, stuff uh, that it provides uh, to speed up some of their optimization processes so yes we can you can use compass with anything in the entire python uh, ecosystem so if it exists in python you can use it with compass and if you can't use it directly in rhino because it is for example something like pytorch or tensorflow then compass through um, these remote procedure calls and that server that i um, uh, spoke about briefly that also allowed us to run the force density method um, allows you to um, uh, use those uh, things even in rhino Good. Any question from students? Welcome. Hello, Professor. Can you hear me? I, yes, I can hear you. Uh, uh, I have two questions. Mm, the first is that I noticed that Compass is like a glue between many existing softwares and has a lot of interaction with Rhino and Grasshopper since they are very useful and powerful geometry platform for designers. But yeah. at the same time, it seems that Compass has its own visualization and operating platforms. Yeah. And also Compass has many basic and fundamental tools such as geometry and data structure, which is a very hard and uh, big system, yes. Uh, so yeah. how can we use us choose or have a balance between the existing 
existing softwares and compass uh, because they are I think they are the same functions. Yeah. No, no, understood. Right. No, no, that's a good question indeed. So um maybe something to it that is important to point out is that um first of all compass is not an all or nothing tool right so it's not that um when you work with compass you have to use only compass so when you use compass in rhino for example in the script editor in rhino you can mix it with um uh rhino python or rhino script syntax or rhino common or uh, the same in blender right the reason for um, making sure that um, Compass has all of these standalone bits and pieces, so like the um, geometry and the data structures and so on, is that, um, for example, I um, in, in many of our projects, Rhino is a little bit in my way, kind of, uh, in the sense that uh, I need to be able to use a lot of libraries that are written in C++ or um, algorithms that are based on NumPy, SciPy, and so on. And I don't want to always set up a package that makes that communication with Rhino uh, very easily, very easy, um, or want to debug why, why something is then not working in Rhino, for example, right? And so then uh, I, I do most of these things um, just directly in the viewer because I have just a lot more tools that I can use there. The goal there is not to replace Rhino. It's just um, absolutely not, by the way, um, or Grasshopper or Blender. The point is to um, provide users with an as flexible as possible setup uh, to use all of these things interchangeably. So if, if, um, if I have to collaborate with somebody from computer science, for example, who doesn't care about Rhino or Grasshopper and doesn't even know uh, what that is, then I can do that. If I have to work with an engineer who works on the Linux box where there is no Rhino, uh, then I can do that. If I um, need to run stuff on a server that, for example, is not um, where, where these kind of softwares are not in installable, then I can do that. Um, if I need to very quickly exchange with an engineering office, then I can do that, right? And so the point is that um, you we make it as simple as possible for everybody to do their thing. If your thing is working in Rhino, then by all means work in Rhino, right? But if you then need to take the data out of Rhino and need to give this to somebody who works in a different ecosystem on a different platform with different tools, then you can do that. So the goal of all of this is not to replace any of these things. It's to make sure that we are not tied to one particular ecosystem with all of its benefits and limitations um, and that we um, uh, are not uh, a priori excluding basically collaborations with certain people and certain stakeholders in our industry. So plus, and that's maybe um, uh, and, and one other thing is that um, to make your research available in a reusable way uh, and allow others to build on top of it, it's important that it is um, usable outside of these particular tools, right? If you make your research available as a grasshopper um, spaghetti, yeah, then that is reusable only to a certain extent and by a certain number of people. And so we, we try to make that a little bit more general um, and, and, and give everybody the freedom and the flexibility to be able to do what, whatever they feel most comfortable with kind of. So that, that is why there is to some extent, some duplication, of course, yes, but there is only um, duplication as far as um, we also make it available outside of Rhino, right? So, for example, we didn't invent the NURBS library and the uh, BREP library that we're using in the background. It existed. It was just a very obscure C++ library that nobody knew about, and we wrapped it so that you can work with NURBS geometry inside Rhino, outside of Rhino, exchange it with Blender, use it in the browser, use it on a server and so on and so on. So all of that to say that the point is to facilitate all of that collaboration. And then maybe one last thing, sorry, this is a longer answer than I was, I was planning for. The data structures that we provide I'm 100% certain that they provide all sorts of things that you cannot do in Rhino, absolutely not. You cannot just tag on um, random information in the way that uh, you can do with um, our data structures um, on the meshes or, well, a network doesn't even exist in Rhino, a full mesh doesn't exist in Rhino, an assembly data structure doesn't exist in Rhino. 
um, uh, there is a, some kind of a mesh data structure, but not in a way that you can start to add information to vertices and edges and faces and so on, like you can do with the data structures in Compass. So some things are duplications, other things are not, but the point is not to duplicate and the point is not to replace. The point is to make it easier to use all of them. Can I maybe add uh, one, one thing that I noticed from our, uh, I mean, on top of everything that Tom said, we noticed with our own researchers that if we force them to think outside of a specific software, that you really try to understand the fundamental aspects. And so you don't accidentally build built in dependencies, like, uh, for example, instead of doing operations where you drag or you project kind of uh, points on kind of target surfaces. These are op operations that take a bit of time and that are uh, very Rhino specific, for example. And, and uh, so we see that our researchers more and more when they are developing their own methods, they are using these lightweight tools because they can iterate faster. They don't have the because you don't need the entire infrastructure of Rhino. As an example, so we, we, we see that Tom has been focusing mainly on, on, on the power and the importance of, of transparent, lightweight, flexible, universal kind of data formats and, and, and approaches and so on. But uh, first and foremost, this was developed for researchers and having actually very lightweight ways to quickly visualize and to see is my code correct and, and then to keep on building. We noticed this in our building, not only in our group, but also, for example, in Gramatio Kohler, that, that researchers are starting to say, yeah, we only, we only open Rhino when we have to make a render for a paper, but we develop everything with our very lightweight, flexible custom tools because it goes faster. Um, yeah. So like something like so to add on to that to that then um, is that for example if you develop something like the CRA solver that I showed for the discrete element modeling right this uses IP opt PyOMO it uses an entire um, uh, list of 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 uh, libraries that you cannot use in Rhino right so for Gene who developed this by the way. Um, it would have been extremely annoying to open Rhino, try something over RPC, then it fails, close Rhino, open it again, try it again. Da, da, da. This would have gotten him nowhere. Now with the viewer, he can just write stuff in VS Code, use all of the libraries that he wants. And then once it's ready, it's done, then we make it available for Rhino so that users have easy access to it. But during development, he can do whatever he needs to do and quickly, like what Philip said, to do these iterations that he would have not been able to do in Rhino. And then maybe one thing about the viewer though, as you can, as you have seen, the viewer provides very basic interactions, right? So we on purpose also don't make it a modeling tool because we really do not try to replace any of the modeling tools that are there. It is just an easy way to, like what I did earlier, to run a script, see the result, rotate it a bit, I, okay, my script works and move on, right? Uh, sorry. Yeah, hey. can I can I add something and maybe give a little <laughs> bit of an up? Oh, sorry. No, maybe no, no, maybe no, yeah, one yeah. thing to add is uh, is uh, uh, something in the pipeline. So something in the outlook is that uh, Tom is now working also on Compass IFC, so the format be behind BIM software, and uh, the reason there is very similar that. Um, uh, BIM as a, as a methodology and the IFC format in general are standards, are, are ambitions, are kind of uh, to, to communicate between. But all the different interpretations of BIM and, and, and uh, applications of BIM in specific software, um, the different ecosystems like Archicad and uh, Autodesk are not necessarily interested in people freely sharing and going back and forth and using all possible tools in the most flexible way. So Tom, that is why Tom is now, uh, together with industry partners, actually um, trying to uh, abstract out and have that more a uh, robust, independent IFC kind of format uh, generator and directly kind of IFC um, um, 
uh, not just interpreter, but also generator, and you can change things and update and so on and so on. That is again independent of, for example, Revit, uh, Revit, or is independent of Archicad, or is independent of how IFC is being implemented for structural engineers. Which well, is and very you can translate again. between them, by the way. Yeah. So that yeah, exactly. Because if you so read an IFC file. No, no, go if ahead, you read an IFC, if you read an IFC file that comes from Revit or from SolidWorks, uh, from um, uh, Vectorworks, or or from Archicad or from um, any any other uh, tool, they they all for the same the same geometry they all do something different, right? So that the way they encode this in the IFC file is vastly different. So you can already not exchange between the three of them. It, it's just, it does, doesn't work. You already need like cloud applications that then do translations for you and so on. But to make research uh, results, for example, available to the industry, yeah, that's completely impossible like this, right? And so if we want to, um, if we want to make uh, or tap, tag onto this this um, this this uh, drive towards uh, making all of this universal and so on, then we need to be able to make robotic processes, um, new floor geometries, um, new formwork systems. You need to make that available through uh, an IFC format. And currently that is extremely complicated if you have to go through the tools that are there. And so there again, indeed, it's the, the goal is to connect the dots to make it simpler for people to do their thing, but not to replace us. It's to connect all of these softwares, right? Um, so, that, so that you can actually use all of them to their maximum power. Blender does something very different than what Rhino does. Uh, Rhino is very good at some things. Blender is good at other things. So with Compass, you can use both actually to their best abilities kind of. So it's, it's, it's to get more out of all of them than, than try to replace any one of them. Great. I think uh, it's interesting. I think uh, Compass actually bridging different softwares and uh, especially for the de uh, developers and the researchers. Uh, and actually um, more and more uh, PhD candidates actually uh, in, in Tongji. Uh, the, uh, I think uh, in the five years ago, maybe we cannot understand fully what you are doing, but actually when we have more PhD candidates, we are facing some problems, how to sharing, connecting or the, uh, collaborating with each other. I think uh, we make a lot of discussion recently on this kind of uh, sharing culture and the learning culture, especially in a special research group. And the most challenge actually, what is the global knowledge and the local uh, uh, partners? Actually, we have different um, uh, 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 standards all over the world. And actually, uh, how to transfer su such kind of um, uh, knowledge into some uh, sharing um, uh, uh, general uh, uh, collaboration uh, softwares is really important. So I think the comments uh, uh, around uh, the IFC is super important um, because uh, uh, the uh, 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 BIM is actually the uh, is really important uh, for us to organize from the uh, uh, generation process to the construction process. And uh, we're looking forward, um, the standard, standardization is important, how to transfer such kind of two bucks um, and uh, into some, 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 some general uh, sharing uh, two bucks to the, all the uh, developers and the users. So I think um, uh, we're super interested in that, uh, but it's, it's still a great challenge about the environmental friendly environment because like Python to Rhino, uh, uh, the version is not super uh, good connected uh, because I think Rhino is, is very slow, going is very slow, but Python is, is like different version. Uh, we, we need to spend time to connecting um, the, uh, uh, the Python environment to, to, to Rhino, but actually uh, a different PhD student, they, have, they use um, uh, different softwares and the, the challenge goes to the specific uh, 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 software need to be developed. And my team uh, in the over uh, past five years, we developed a few robots uh, in Grasshopper. Actually, we, uh, we use some, um, uh, uh, some of them developed in the Rhino environment and some of them outside the Rhino and especially for the robotics uh, 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 implement, implementation. But still, I think uh, it's, it's really difficult. Uh, right now we have around 10 different PhD candidates. They all have different um, research um, uh, uh, toolbox. 
and how to sharing learning and with each other is a great challenge. Uh, and we're facing with uh, and, uh, this problem. Actually, we find um, uh, five years ago, uh, you have already noticed uh, uh, Compass could be a, a future research platform, which is extremely uh, important to us. Is why we we still feel curious on the percentage of the your uh, uh, ETH uh, PhD candidates, um, and if they uh, prefer to use this platform or contribute to their research uh, thesis or two bucks to the Compass. So that is the the super important is a research habit, and whether. Uh, people like to, um, to 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 use this environment. I think it's not because of it's good or not, but because of people uh, uh, whether people uh, would like to contribute and would like to share with each other on this platform. So uh, I think that's the things we 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 are feel super interesting uh, in the future. I think uh, because we have more and more the team is growing, and the knowledge yeah. and also the box is growing super fast. So uh, it's, it's it's super important uh, to not. Uh, 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 starting from the beginning point, the standing on the giant uh, shoulder is important. Like uh, to to learn it from to, uh, from you and learn it from ETH, and uh, the ETH also can sharing your knowledge to the world. I think I really appreciate um, uh, Philip uh, your 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 contribution to the uh, society, to the uh, to the uh, uh, the global society. I think I really appreciate and. Uh, and uh, uh, Compass uh, is super, I think is ahead of uh, the time because uh, six years ago, you start to set up, uh, establish this platform. I think it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's super meaningful to the, to not only to the Europe, but also to the whole world. So thank you so much for the lecture from Thomas at home today. And thank, thank you for my, so much for the three lectures from, uh, organized by Fit Block. I think uh, it's, it's important. We have uh, many uh, graduate students and PhD candidates here. Uh, for them, it's just open a, a window for them to understand the different uh, digital culture. And actually, uh, uh, some of them just start uh, learning. I think uh, they, they have a special opportunity to see what's happening and uh, learning from, from, from the world. So thank you so much for sharing. And thank you. Uh, let's keep in touch. Uh, I think uh, we almost to time. So thank you, Tom. You gave the wonderful lecture today. Let's keep in touch. Thank you Thanks for the invitation for the for the three sessions, Philip. And I um, um, we'll, we'll be following up. Tom prepared uh, uh, some files so that people can follow up. And I also yes. still need to send uh, my lecture notes from last time. But thanks again, okay. and I hope it was interesting to everyone. And nice to see you and be be in touch indeed. Thank you. Thank you so Ciao. much. Ciao, Ciao Philip. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.